we didn't have a speaker this month, and so I volunteered, I think, yesterday to do No, this. I volunteered. Did you volunteer me or was it coming? <laughs> I, I, I may have said something before you did. So um, what I want to talk about was this thing called Advent of Code. Um, so it is a, um, an online coding like set of puzzles that's come out. This is the third year. It's run by a guy named Eric Wastel, I believe his name is, um, who I think might be a Perl programmer. Um, and he's put this up. So, um, so I'll show you how this all works. So if you go to um, Advent of Code for um, 2017, you'll see something like this. If you're not logged in, you'll, you won't see all of this stuff down here. Also, this year, if I refresh it, it'll draw something different, which is kind of cool. If you want to show them, that, just open it up in uh, incognito, and I'll show you what it's like if you're not logged in. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> so it'll just, yeah, it won't have that. I mean, it's not all that different. Um, so the way it works is you go to something. So this is day one. And every one of them works this way, where you get some sort of a problem, and they're all involved. Well, the first year they involved trying to save, trying to help out Santa Claus and the elves. The whole Christmas scene. Last year, for reasons I don't quite recall, it involved the Easter Bunny, who was trying to sabotage Christmas, as the Easter Bunny is, you know, want to do. And this year. There's a problem with Santa's printer that prints out the naughty or nice list, and you've been put into the computer to try to fix 50 bugs in the software so that the printer can, driver can work and then print up the naughty and nice list. That's the backstory. It, it almost doesn't matter. Um, so, you get a problem, and every problem has two parts to it. And unfortunately, you'll see all of both parts because I've done all of them. Um, and they give you some simple examples of how it all works. Can everyone read this? Um, and then you get you get your own input, which looks oh, wait, I can do this down here. Um, so this is what my input looks like for the problem. So you see it's very long. And then you use that input to come up with some answers. So let's look at what this is. So you have a string that's just a bunch of digits between, I think, one and nine, maybe, maybe zero is part of it too. And they want you to find any, oh, sorry, um, anything where, if, if one digit, if the digit following it is the same as the current digit, then that's a match. And you add up what that digit, the digit is. So here, one and one is a match, and two and two is a match. You add up those two numbers, you get three. Okay? Here, one, 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 these are all matches. If for the fourth one, you have to wrap back around to the beginning. So this fourth one matches the first one. Okay? Um, here there's no matches because one doesn't match two, two doesn't match three, three doesn't match four, and four doesn't match one. Here the only match is this nine, which wraps around from the end to the end. Yes? I just want to point out that after playing around with this this year and last year, um, there are sometimes corner cases that the example problems that they give you when you go to try to code against it, where you will pass the examples but you will fail miserably on your actual problem set. So, right. so sometimes, as Will said, there is a case that they didn't tell you. Uh, more often, you don't interpret it quite right, or there's something you didn't think of. Um, I don't think that there have been any corner cases. So well, sir, far. I wouldn't say corner cases. It's just one of those things of you can make some assumptions to pass the example validation, but if you cut corners or did not understand the problem when you actually get your problem set, you're just going to be wrong, and it's frustrating. Okay. So, so is there right. a problem set that comes later where you actually have to input code? As no, you never have to input the code. All you no. have to do is okay. So what you what you have to submit. It, so if if your input was one one two two, then your output would be three, and that you have to plug that in to a text box. So that's how it works. They give you they give you some sort of problem, and the answer is always a number or a string, and that has to go into the box. And every person who does it gets their own unique input so that everyone also has their own output. So you could steal someone's code and, you know, and run it on your input, but you can't just take, so 
just because you see here that my puzzle answer was 1393, that doesn't help you at all because if you do it, you're going to have different input and it's not going to add up to 1393. Yeah, the problems are So all, all that I had to do for problem one was put 1393 into <coughs> the text box and hit enter and it tells me whether it's right or wrong. Okay? Go so. <laughs> so, um, I've done, the way that I do these is I take, so I should say that I've done all the problems in the first two years and I've, I've done all of them up to today's as well. And today's day 12. So there's been 12 of them so far. So about halfway through this year's. Um, so what I do is, for each of the, these, is I take the sample input and I write those out to a file called like test.txt. And I run my program on that and I see if I get the answers that they got. And then I try it on the big string and I see if I got that. So, again, <coughs> let's look at what my, my actual input was. Right, so my input is just this ridiculous long string of numbers. And you probably can't read it, but it doesn't even matter. You get the sense that it's just tons and tons of digits. So right? you just done it by hand. Right, so it's big enough that you can't do it by hand. So the question is, so how do you go about solving something like this? So I, I've done every one of these this year. In, all, in past years, I would do them in Perl, and sometimes I would do them in another language if I felt like it. This year, I've done all of them in Perl, all of them in Python, because I'm trying to get better at Python. And some of them I've done in C++, too, if I felt like it. So, um, right, so let's, right, so let's talk about how we do this, right? So, um, I don't know if we want to start with them. So you have to you have to read this in. So what, let's talk about like how you want to what sort of data structure you want to store this in. Um, and I mean you probably like, for something like this, probably the simplest thing is just read it into a big string, right? And then you can iterate over the strings and do it. Um, and so that's that's like the one. Tr there's two tricky things in this. One is you have to read in the string and store it somehow, which is have to do for almost all of them. And then you have to deal with the fact that you have to match the last digit back to the first digit. Um, which um, I know when Andy shared his code that he was doing it in kind of a convoluted way. Um, so um, I don't know. So when you did it, well, I'll ask Will since you did it. How did you do with the wrapping around the problem? What do, you, uh, what do you mean with the text? How did you, how did you match this last digit? So let's go back to the, the input, which is bigger. Um, how, did you, how did you match, like, for the... Uh, I've talked before now. How did you match up this guy and oh, make that, sure that the nine, the 9 on the end matched the 9 at the beginning? I threw the whole thing and treated it like a cyclic buffer. And then I just went through... So how did you treat it like a cyclic, a cyclic buffer? Like, what did you do to do that? I just did a for loop, and at the end, if they tried to call the next one and it didn't exist, it would just automatically call the first one. It was just a, it was okay. a single condition that I looked for. Um, I don't have my right, solution in front right. of me. Which so you kind of can do for that one, it doesn't help you for the next part, as, as you probably discovered. Yes. So, um, I... <clears throat> okay, so I've put all of my code up on... Do they show you both parts up front, or do you have to build No, you don't thing? see the second part until you've solved the first part. That's so that's going to throw a monkey wrench and everything. Right, they often throw a monkey yes. wrench. <laughs> Which is right now <laughs> problem three this year, is, done, is doing this to Rachel. Yep. It did the same thing to me. And thankfully, because Walt's been on the ball with all this, he warned us ahead of time. Okay, so I'm going to start with the Python code, which is probably easier to do. Oh, wow, that's a lot longer than mine. <laughs> is it? My, uh, this is solving both parts. Yeah. Okay. Um, My part one was only <coughs> two lines. How did you did you hardwire the data? I mean, half of this is reading the data. In. Oh no, it was. Oh well, I put yeah, I, I made the, I put I pasted the data into a variable. Oh, um, so some of, okay. So I'll just run through how I how I start all of them. Um, I, I take the file name from RV, which is what I'm doing here. Is it big enough to read? Do I need to make it a little bit bigger? It can be a little bigger. That's funny. Um, well, that works, yeah. So, so I read the file name in, um, and I open it, and I go through line by line, and I strip, out the, I strip off the new line at the end. Do I have to? I, 
is there any cleaner way to do this? Because I end up doing like these four yeah. lines. Well, are there even new lines in that? Well, okay. I mean, there might be in some of them. And well, I guess this one all, I could have left the new line off. Why are you using the with statement for opening the file there instead of just calling up the file and dumping it to a, a, a variable that returns? Um, because I didn't know I could do that. Oh, okay. So in Python, and this is there's there's two ways to handle it, but the with statement in Python is kind of is the same of saying I want to have these type of variables, but it's for scoping specifically. So that means in this in this particular case, the reason why they would do this is with uh, the file name f. When you are out of that indented block of that width, f goes out of scope. Otherwise, you just have a manual file object that you are managing, and the only thing that width does for you that the file object or that you have to do for yourself on the file object is do like f dot close at the end, which is to be clean. But even when the program exits, it does that anyway. Okay, so I will I will look into that. So just I have that in all the programs. So forget the step the step the step thing for a while. So I wanna I wanna iterate over I wanna iterate over every so so now so I've ran it into a line and line is just all those all those digits. And I'm gonna go I is gonna go from zero up to the length of the line. Um, and so instead of having to deal with the special case for the last the last uh, thing, I just mod it by the length of the line, and that way when it gets to the end, it wraps back around. Mm -hmm. um, does everyone know about? Do you know about mod, and, and you can use it to wrap things around like that? That's clever. Yep. I did not know. Well, I know what mod is, but I wouldn't have thought to do that. But. Um, it's what a common thing to do. Great. So that's really all that I did. So if if it's equal to the next one, but I add one to it and then I mod it by lines, that way I've got the last one, it wraps back around to zero again. Um. Oh, I did learn something uh, interesting. Um, for your line, uh, was it when you had like the line and I in there? You can treat it like a vector, because um, I did mine all as a string, mm -hmm. and I did it convert to an integer. If you put a negative number, it actually works backwards. So, it, so Depending on what value you throw in there, it actually can work like a cyclic buffer depending on how you handle it. Yeah, but then you have a special case at the end. I don't have any special cases, but I treat them all like that. And this True. for the second so for the second part, which was so after you've solved that, and again that's pretty easy. It was just really that I mean there was all, all that stuff setting it up, but the actual guts of it was like two lines of code. Um, for the second part, um, they say what? Um, Instead of the next digit, you have to look at the digit that's halfway around from it. So, which is a lot trickier to do with like the special case of dealing, but like, you can't just look at the end. And so, um, what I did for that was I calculated like how far halfway around is, and that's just the step is the length of the line divided by two. And then, um, this is ex this slide is exactly like that. So, 14 is exactly like 12, except um, at, instead of adding one, I'm adding this step. For the second part, and then I'm modding it by the line again, and that takes care of all the wraps. So I wanted to show. So okay, so for people that don't know about mod, and I think some people don't know about mod, can everyone read? Is that too far down? Is it, is it Looks good. Um, video. Okay, so mod is so you know if you have like so if you say ten divided by three, it divides, it, right? Do I need to make that big? I feel like I need to make it bigger. If I say, but if I say 10 mod 3, mod, the operator for mod is percent, then that's the remainder. So, so it's, it's 3 and then with the remainder of 1. So why do you need the remainder? What's it good for? So um, one thing it's it's good for is you can tell whether something even or odd. So if I say 10, 10 mod two, that's zero. If I say right, so if the remainder is one, then it's odd. If the remainder is zero, it's even. So this is a really simple way to test whether something's even or odd. Is you just mod it with two, and if it's zero, it's even. If it's if it's one, it's odd. Um, also, it gives you 
cycles. So let's say uh, for i uh, equals So the mods always go in a cycle. So it's 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. Anytime you need to have something that's cyclic like that, mod is, is a really great way to do that. Huh. Um, so that gives, you, that gives you cycles without doing any, really any work at all. Oh, I see what you mean. I was actually thinking cycles in terms of buffer versus... No, no, a cycle where you want to have something just go loop back to zero after a certain point. Got it. And you don't have any special cases, like there's no if statements, there's just that mod and it takes care of everything for you. Uh, you can also use mod, mod's also useful for like time calculations, because you're always doing things in base 60 and you need to deal with all that. So, so how many seconds, you have some number of seconds, some, you have 342 seconds, right? So that's how many minutes and how many seconds. So if you mod it by 60, that's how many seconds. Okay. If you divide it by 60, that's how many minutes. If you mod it, that's how many seconds. So, all right, so that's problem one. Uh, <clears throat> which was, usually they start off pretty simple and then they get a little bit harder as they go on. So anyone have any questions about that? So let's look at problem, at problem two. Yeah. I have a different way that I did it, though. If you want to... Do you want to talk about that, or? Do um, you want to... Yeah, I, I, I actually just put the... Put that up. And, um, in my GitHub, what I did for the first one was um, I used a zip. What's your what's your GitHub? Uh, Rayco Nato. Can I just put a slash in here? Uh, yeah. Slash. How do you, how do you know how I spell it? R e i k o. R e i k o. Upper N e k o. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and the zip, what does zip do? Um, zip takes two um, iterables and pairs them side by side. So if okay. you have A, B, C, and 1, 2, 3, so it'll give you A, 1, B, 2, C, 3. So this is this is going right. This is the trickier one. Yeah. Um, Where I just split it. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So I'm gonna have to study these and see how this is actually working. Yeah. So let's look. Let's move on to number two, which is another I think kind of simple one. Um, <laughs> for Okay, if I had to write it in Perl, I'd be much longer. <laughs> but I did it the same way in both of, in both of them. My Perl yeah. code, my Perl code is looks probably looks a little bit more obfuscated if you're not used to it, but it's exactly the same algorithm. Which is typically what I do. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was doing the same thing. It's a little less work up front maybe because I understand I'm doing, I'm doing a Perl error, but. This is, this is, it looks different, but it's, it's doing exactly the same thing. It looks like a Python, but retarded. 
Oh my god. Exactly. Um, okay, so for the for the first part, what you get is a list of numbers. You get you get a, a a grid of numbers. You get a bunch of numbers, and for every one of the lines, you have to find the difference between the largest and the smallest value on the line, and then subtract them. And then for all those things, you add them all up, and then that's your answer. Again, you could probably Rachel probably done that in one line in in Python. So read it as an array and use your max and your min. Done on the array. Right. So you read it in. You read it as an array, or you split it. I think they're separated by spaces, so you have to do yeah. some sort of a split on them. Yeah, you do a split on, on space, but which works when you type it out. Otherwise, it's actually tab delimited on that. So when you go to grab your input, so you actually look for the slash so T. This is almost one where you could have done it. You could have done the first part just by mm -hmm. this one isn't. I'm the lowest point. This is so small that they're almost like not trying for that one. So yeah, I mean the code. The code for this one was. I mean, what do you have to do for that? You have to. I'll show up with Python again just because I want to show off with Python. I have the same crap where I'm where I'm reading it in, and then I split it, and then I sum up. Um, yeah, the max of the dowels minus the min of the dowels for each of the lines. And there wasn't much to that. The second part was a little trickier uh, because the second one, you had to find a pair that divided each other evenly and then return the, uh, the product of the two of them. Not the product, the, uh, the, uh, the division, the division of the two of them. You had to divide them, whatever the verb is. Um, the division. Um, and I mean that's that once you've done the first part, it's pretty straightforward. Right? So those aren't that, that super interesting. Um, although I did like again, I was sort of annoyed. The only real difference between the Perl and the Python is when you read it in Perl, it treats if it's a number, it just treats it as a number, but in Python you always have to put int in front of it, even though it's a numeric. And it throws me off every single time. Um, the third problem is more interesting. Um, you have this spiral where, okay, so the idea is we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way around, potentially infinitely. We keep going around like that. And they are going to give you a number that lives on the spiral somewhere, and the spiral goes out you know, indefinitely. And you have to return the, the distance to go from that number back to the central one in the middle. And they want the Manhattan distance, which means you have to go along straight lines. You can't go to the angle. You either have to go left, right, up, or down. So if you're at one, it's zero. If you're at eight, it's one. If you're at 12, it's, you have to go down one and then across. So that's one, two, three. Um, but it can get pretty, it can get really big, right? My number, I think, was like five digits. So, um, okay. So you understand the problem, right? The problem is pretty simple, but solving it is, is you know, it's pretty it's, simple on paper. It's si simple on paper. It's simple to understand. understand. Yes. So, <laughs> so there is a. <laughs> A somewhat similar set of problems called a project Euler, and I'm bringing this up just because it has a. Some of their problems involve the spiral, and they have a bigger version of the spiral. So, what was the best way that you saw to generate that spiral? Um, I didn't come up with a way to generate the spiral. Well, crap. I, I did. I'll show you my code. But it's 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 ugly. That was the whole reason um, why I showed up today. <laughs> so I wanted to show because they have a. This is a completely different problem where you're looking for prime numbers in and it doesn't matter. But it does have a bigger grid, and you can see some patterns in the bigger grid. So I'm going to give away how how I did this. Um, so the first thing you can see is that if you go down this this diagonal here, it's always they're always uh, odd squares. And not only are there odd squares, but that's always oh, yeah. the largest number in that ring. So, 
if, if, you look at, if you look at those, if you keep increasing the squares, you know what ring your number is in. Okay, and that helps you a lot. Because I, so I don't, for this part of the problem, I don't generate the entire, the entire spiral because, as Will said, it's a, it's a pain in the butt to generate the spiral. And then even after you've generated it, coming up with some algorithm to do it is also hard. But this is our cheating. This is the cheating way of doing it. So these numbers tell you what, so if I have a number between 26 and 49, I know that I'm on this uh, one, two, third ring out. Okay? So... Then, so if I were on this one of the axes here, this one or this one, the distance is just what ring I'm in, right? So if I'm at 46, I'm on the third ring and it's 3 in. If I'm at 40, I'm also 40, I'm also on the third ring. Okay. And this is due to the Manhattan distance algorithm, where basically no matter how many rings out, that's always going to be consistent. Right. It's always going to go up. It's always going to go up by one. And it turns out that there's a pattern to what these numbers are. Um, so if you start with two, four, six, eight, then to go from two to eleven, one more out, that it goes up nine, and this one goes up eleven, and this one goes up thirteen, and then oh, okay. and then fifteen. Huh. And then 17, so they just keep going up by two every one. So you can generate all of those, all those axes, and then once you have the numbers for all of the axes, all you have to do is know how, how long it takes you to get from like 44 to 46, and then you just subtract to take the absolute value. That sounds a lot more complicated than what I did. Right? Why is that complicated? Yeah, I, that doesn't seem complicated. Like, there's only like three steps. I mean, the, the code is like this big. I'll show you. There's hardly any code to it at all. You did iteration. I just jumped to with, um, you know, I, I just took the square root and then took the um, the odd numbers above and below that. To know the square what, root? Yes. Why is the square root of the square? Huh? The square root of the square. You mean you're showing the square root? The no, squares. I took, I the, took, square root I took of... the square root of target number. Okay, so yeah. I have like 44 here. And you take, so let's take some of this, okay, I take 36, the square root of that is 6. Yeah. How is that helping me? 1, 2, <coughs> 3, 4. So how does that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, how does 36, how do we get 5 and 36? Yeah. That told me how, that, that told me how many um, rings I had in my spiral. <coughs> oh, got it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. imagine, yeah. okay, so basically the square root isn't going to be perfect, but it will give you in the ballpark, and you can chop off some decimals and yeah. figure out. But the square root is six. And what's six it's about that? It's not in the, it's in the, it's in the third ring. No, you, it's in the you, third you, ring. It's in the third ring. ring. It's not in the sixth ring. No, no but if you follow the, but, the, but the bottom it, right uh, corner, <coughs> you get a, a series, but a numerical series. Basically, but, if you do so, the square root and add one integer to it, you'll be on that ring. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I want to look at Rachel's code for that too, but I'll show you what I did. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it's still more disgusting than what I did, but okay. <laughs> Tintoni. <laughs> right, there's lots of ways to do all of these. Mm -hmm. I went digital single price, addition and subtraction, everything. <laughs> Why? I, mean, I need to save the cycles, man. Yeah. Keep going. I do. Glad we don't. So I'm going to make this... Oh no, you still do. You're just working on bigger systems. <coughs> when, when someone says 14 cents is too expensive, you need to use a 12 cent part. Well, damn it, you're going to use a 12 cent part and you're going to recount those cycles. That's true. That's true. I don't, I don't think we get asked that a lot. Well, people say solve it, right? You're going to be a waste of but... If they're going to ask you that so, question, you're going to charge them a lot of time to do that. So that almost fixed. So I read in the target from the from the command line. I initialize some things. I figure out um, for every for every one of the the rings, I keep track of the layer, what the C is and what the corner is, and I keep adding two to east, south, north, and east, north, east, south, and west. And then once I once I hit a match, so I've fallen out of the loop, I just take the min of these four things, and that's it. That's all that I have to do. Oh. So that works. So it works. It's fast. Yeah. 
<coughs> Where's those square roots? So you're, well, okay, yeah, you know why we Right, so let me have iterating. But, yeah, I'm just keeping, for every one of the layers, I'm keeping track of what the corner and the north, south, east, west, and the south, east corner are. And that's enough to get an answer. Uh, pretty much what I think. <coughs> yeah, I. That looks like it's much better at solving the next. No, this is not me at all for the next problem. I had to do. I had to start because I haven't done. I had, I, never, I didn't actually make the um, <coughs> the spiral, and you need to do the spiral. spiral. You need, you need to go around the spiral in order to do the other the second part. Well, yeah. the, the second part, what you have to do is. Uh, well, I will have to say, uh, using that method, you can modify what you did with the previous problem. Seeing how you can kind of basically kind of generate what you want for each ring. What you do for the problem is that you find the maximum number of rings you need, and then you can actually just populate all of that. So you have like a grid system. You might figure out what the maximum grid is. You, fi uh, you put your origin in there, and then from there you just kind of populate um, the sequence all the way out. So that way you can call up index the sequence and relate it to a coordinate. So the way the way you were supposed to, you have to do the second part is you start with the one in the middle, and then everything else is the sum of all of the so everything else is zero, and then the other ones are the sum of all the things that have been filled in so far. So for this one, the only one that's been filled in is one, so its sum is one. Here. These two have been filled in, so its number is two. It's one plus one. Here, so now we're spiraling over. We're up here, and now there's three numbers filled in, so it's one plus one plus two is four. Here, we're headed to fifty-four. <laughs> when you get to here, the only numbers are four and one, so it's five. Here, we've got five, four, one, so it's ten, and it just keeps going, and and they get they get big pretty fast. It's like the Fibonacci sequence from now. It kind of looks Fibonacci yeah. sequence a little bit, and yeah, I thought about doing something like that. And what I I just basically wrote that that algorithm just like I said it. And if the, the, code, if the Fibonacci sequence was a pi, now it's going to be something between no, pi, clown, and I'm not sure that the Fibonacci has the pi has much to do with Fibonacci. No, no, it's phi. It's phi. <laughs> this is it's ugly, but I just generate the whole thing and. This is how I add it up. Like I just add all of them. I think I initialize it all to zero. And I have something that's just keeping track of the direction I'm going. And yeah, that's that's what I did. So it's really brute force and it's not all interesting. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So how much seeing how that you're not the most comfortable with Python, but you are exposed to a prior. How's your development time um, with Perl versus Python, even if you've solved it once with Perl? It depends on the problem. So for this one, if I bring that back up, um, I'm seeing if there's anything weird. Um, this was, I, I, well, I will say, just comparing them, that some of these this is maybe one of the, the simpler ones where it's pretty, it's more or less straightforward. So this, this was a map probably, or this was, this line here was something different in Perl. So, so for some of these things I have to figure out like how, how do I initialize, so I will say that I started my grid in the middle, I started it at 10 comma 10 and I just sort of spiraled out from that so we didn't have to worry about negative subscripts. Mm -hmm. That was the other trick that I did doing this. Um, so for things like this I had to figure out what was the right way to do it in Python. Um, a lot of the Python code ends up Parts of it look a little bit cleaner because there's no there's no punctuation variables. So if you compare that <laughs> to this is what the Perl code looks like. Um, you see there's lots of dollar signs everywhere. And especially when they're like short variables, they tend to clutter things up a lot more. When they're kind of longer variables, I don't notice it as much. But okay. for this, um, what did I do? I think I didn't even bother initializing it because I just turned warnings off in Perl. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, because it, it, it undef is, gets treated as zero. You get an error, but I know that it's not an error. This isn't so, a library. Right, and so I will say, so, so there's a couple other things. That, like, you can do it any way you want. Like, one thing is that all you have to do is get the answer. 
Yes. Like this is not production code. Uh, you don't have to handle every possible situation. You just have to be able to get the answer. If you want to know what a scientist code looks like, find an engineer, someone who hasn't been properly trained as a programmer and who hasn't done it professionally, and look at how they go to solve this. That is exactly what I found. I saw at NOAA for their code. So, yeah, what I probably, I don't know, I guess I could have, I could have put in a subroutine and only put it in one place. I, I thought of that afterwards, that there's really only like one place where I ever, at the, in the subroutine that does the add is the only place I really needed to worry about that. I probably should have turned off warnings down here instead of opening it, but um, there you go. Oh, also, there's one thing about it. Wrote that you can actually understand what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I split. It. I wanted to to look like I was adding up the uh, the numbers. Oh, oh yeah, that that that's like practically self documented. At least those three lines. <laughs> well, <laughs> as self documented as Perl can ever get. Uh, right, and the other thing is always it's always a little tricky whether you're doing I's and J's or X's and Y's or rows and columns. And rows tend to be are, are actually like the Y and not the 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 x, so if you do row column, that's like y comma x, it's not x comma y. But as long as it's a grid, it doesn't really matter. What um, about your, um, well, you had to pre-fill the, uh, I pre the array, didn't you? I pre-filled, in Perl, <laughs> I didn't, because I tr everything gets initialized to undef, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter, because undef okay. is zero. Right. If, it gives you a warning, but I turned the warnings off. Uh, in Python, I initialize. Been, in Python, initial I initialize the whole thing. You didn't really initialize it as you backfilled the MIP to be zero again. Um, it's initialization. What do you mean I backfilled it? I took. There's different. I made I made a ten by ten grid, mm -hmm. which is what this is, um, or I made a twenty by twenty, right? Because that's z, z times two, and I set them all to be zero. I initialized the 20 by 20 array to There's a way zeros. in Python, so when Python goes to create it... Oh yeah, there were, I couldn't find what that was, and I just did it. Okay, it. yeah, that's what I meant. That, it, that was initialized, that was going back, because you're essentially just setting the value from none to zero, then when you go back through it, versus yeah. the initialization step. Um, yeah, I remembered that, I couldn't, I couldn't remember how to do it, so I found this. So I you use brackets, and you put the value in the middle, right next to it. Uh, was four, what was stage four? We'll see how far, what time is it? It's like e What other one? What other one's interesting? Uh, no. I didn't know I'll just go through them and we'll see. Uh, yes, by the way. Oh, it's like that's right. I'll probably get it. Except you're just because of the engine was your poor. <laughs> okay, so, so for this one, what they give you is um, a, a bunch of strings that are separated by spaces, and it's supposedly a passphrase, except that, you know, it's just like this. And, and you have to, it's valid if all of the words are unique. So here, this is valid because A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E, are the same, but for this one it's not valid because AA appears twice. Mm -hmm. And as usual, if I look at my puzzle input, I get this enormous thing, right? So you can't check this off by hand, obviously. So, and then I think what you have to do is return how many of the passphrases are valid. So, um, so what? So did you, we'll ask Will who has not done this, or someone else, so, <clears throat> okay. How, so what you have to do is for every one of the lines, it's valid or not valid, you have to check whether every, a word is something that's still in my spaces. So A, A, B, B, C, C, D, E, E, E are all words. Mm -hmm. And as long as all five of, all of the words on a line are unique, then it's okay. <clears throat> but if any of them are repeated, like AA and AA here, that it's not valid. This one, it is valid because AA and AAA are different. So it's not prefixes right, they have to be exact matches. So... Well, you said a lot. All right, so, right, so the, line, the, the input looks like 
<clears throat> so the Python way I would do this is I would use an ordered dictionary, and then from there I would actually populate each value in there. So when you go to do the ordered dictionary and you go to say, okay, here's the a a a a a a whatever, um, you can actually have it set up so it'll actually count how many times you've input that. And when you're done at the very so end, every, you just this go, is the line. Every one of these is a line, and right. one, that's what you have to check. Okay. Right. And you'll have to validate it for the entire uh, just right. for that's the line. That's doing yeah. It's doing you can use sets instead of instead of dictionaries. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so you don't have to count them. Once you, for every, everything, you just check whether it's, it's there or not, and if it's already in, in it, you can bail out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I compared length of set to length of line, and it so was a mismatch. I think that that's probably all pi entropy that you um, Look, I even have a I even have a list comprehension here. So I split it, and for each of them, oh no, that that was that was the easy one. That was the harder one. Um, I don't have a list comprehension. Here. I split it, and then I start I start with uh, an empty set, and then for every one of the words, if it's already in the set, then oh, I'm returning zero. I probably should return true or false. Oh well. Um, otherwise, I add it to the set, and then. If I get to the bottom and I haven't returned zero already, I return one. And I probably should have returned true or false. I forgot. Uh, but that's it. Uh, so that was fairly straightforward. But then the second part is a little bit tricky. On well, the second part, you have to say also, they're also invalid if two of the words are anagrams of each other. So how do you check whether two words are anagrams of each other? And there's a trick for that, too. And if you saw some of the code, you saw what I did. Um, uh, what? Oh, you, you just add the anagram to the set? No. No, that's not what I did. Because there, there's potentially a lot of them, right? There's, oh, 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 right, there's, no, there's like, so, right, there's like N, anagrams, yeah. Right, there's, for anagrams, there's like N factorial anagrams. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you would. Alright, so anyone else? How do you check whether two words are anagrams of each other? Sorted. Right, right. So if you sort the letters, <coughs> so you sort them in the set as a sort, and by, if you sort the letters, you sort the sort in, in there. So that's what I did yeah. here. And so for every one of them, I treat the, the, the password as a list, and I sort it, and I join them back together with, with an empty string, and that's my key. Wow. Look, it's a list comprehension. Yay, a list comprehension. I think it's more or less what I did in Perl, too. Um, well, they don't have an anagram function you can call for Perl? I'm sure there's um, a module. No, because this is, I mean, I mean, maybe there's a module. There may, yeah. very well maybe a module, but it's, you don't, if there were, it would be something like, tell me what the, what the anagrams are of this word. And that's not what you want to do here. What you want to do is whether it's so two words are anagrams of each other. Um, just, I don't know. It's, this is how you do it. So you, you sort them. If you sort them, then you can compare them. You can compare the sorts. So, um, Line 31 is not self-documenting. Uh, this is pretty much what I did in the Python code, too. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to do it in one line instead of... And it's but that's pretty much what I'm doing there. To a big of had them side by side, um, they're pretty much the same, the same thing. I got I learned this trick from the Kernighan and Pike book of the Unix programming language. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, they had an example because every Unix um, system, even from the the 70s when they wrote that book, has a list of words in it, a big long list of words, which is great for doing word puzzles mm -hmm. and. If you want to check for anagrams in there, what you do is you sort them, and you um, you sort them, and then I think you do unique dash c. Yeah, I'm gonna say I can't like not just saying it. So first of all, you're the only other person I've ever talked to that actually has that book, and I'm trying to remember where I heard it, and that's that where that that's where yeah, it came so that's from. Where, that's where I learned this trick. Yeah. And trip, every once in a while, it comes to handy. Because that's and how they explain a unique, like you sort a unique in um, that system program. Uh, Okay, so we have time for maybe a couple more. Uh, let's do number five. Five is pretty straightforward, too. Um, you said these were pretty easy until 11 or 12? Three. Everything else is... You said three, <laughs> but after three, you said there was 12 or 11 was a... What was the one with the... Maybe we'll jump to, we'll jump to 
complete after this. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is the one where I did the timing that was kind of interesting, um, which is why I wanted to do this one. So, what you have, and these are showing the same thing. So, what you have here is a bunch of jump offsets. So you start at the beginning. So what they've done is they've taken this list and they flattened it out like that. So at every step, you um, you jump either forwards or backwards based on what this number is. Okay. Plus, uh, no, you jump forward that many steps, and then you increment the value that that had been here. So here it, you, it was zero. It becomes one, you don't move anywhere, and this becomes one. Okay. Then you you, if you move. don't move anywhere. Wouldn't you still be at zero? And then what do you add? You add. You jump. Then you add one. You now jump. You're gonna, now and you're then you add anything. one. And, but there's this. You jump. You add one. But what's the? Work. But there was one other thing. What was it? It was you. You jump. You jump based on the current position. You have to jump the offset. Is right. There was no. Yeah, I think that was it. That's it. That's all it's doing. Yeah. I thought there was something else. Some of them had a separate variable, but I don't think this one had it. Um, okay, so now we're here, and now we jump. We jump forward one, so we go over to here, and this gets incremented to two. Now we're three, and we go three steps forward, one, two, three. This becomes four. Now we're here. Now we have to go backwards three. One, two, three. We're back here. This becomes minus two. But now we go forwards, one, two, three, four. We've gotten out of it, and this becomes five, and it doesn't matter. So you just do this. You have this big, long list of numbers, and you're either going up or down, up or down, based on what the number is, and you're incrementing things, and eventually you fall out. And your output is how many steps it took to leave either off the top or the bottom. All right? And again, my, my input is really, really long, right? And you can see that for the first part, it took 373,000 hundred and sixty steps. <laughs> um, for the second part, it's the same thing, except if the number is, what is it? If it's, if the offset was three or more, then you, you decrease it by one instead of increasing it by one. And then it took some number like two million or <coughs> 26 million or whatever. I see a new version of Core Wars coming out after this. So. <laughs> um, so The code for this is, as you would think, pretty straightforward, right? Um, <clears throat> right, I read in all the lines, I convert them to integers, and I store them in this list called PGF. And then run the program. You know, I'm stepping and I'm adding and subtracting, right? This is this is like the whole, like literally the whole guts is here. Um, I did it in Perl where it looks pretty much the same, and I also did it in C++ just for the hell of it, um, because again, it's a really short program and there's no parsing or anything for this, or very little parsing, right? There's a, a vector and an A2I, and that's about all the parsing you have to do for it. Um, okay, so. For this one, I thought it would be fun to right. So here's my programs, and let's write time curl maze two. Okay, about six seconds, right? Six or seven seconds. All right, now let's try Python 2. And 
You want to have fun? <laughs> Actually, yeah. <laughs> Holy crap, man. So that's like almost 13 seconds. Let's look at Python 3. Quite the same code. Yeah. Have you decided, have you ever uh, thought about running any of this in like AWS just for shits and giggles? No. <laughs> I haven't. Python 3. Can I do it on son? <laughs> Is it web scale? <laughs> you do it Let's do it for like a 30 terabyte input list. <laughs> No, the input, you can see how big the input is. The input's 25,000. We are not, uh, was it processing CSV files for your Uncle Tron, all right? Okay, so 19 and a half seconds. So how long do you think the, the, the C++ code is going to take? I would say. Uh, 0.4. Probably less like clock. Okay, you ready? <clears throat> Yeah. Nice. Damn it, I was off by a <laughs> did, did you try writing an assembly too? What's, right, so, so what's even the resolution of that timer? <laughs> so there's 1,078 lines in that. Uh, okay, so that was fun. Uh, what optimizations did you build the C++ Dash for? Dash 03. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Bravo! <laughs> I didn't expect you to remember that. Yeah. Why would you want to optimize it for anything other than three? Style points? I did dash over Also, also which uh, which C++ compiler did you use? Did you use Clang? I got similar results in GCC on my on my Linux box at home. I put you on this is Clang on my laptop. Clang, okay. Yeah. Clang is LLVM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clang, okay. LLVM. Yeah, I got there. It's the same. I mean, it runs. It runs like with high you know, under like under you know, like ten milliseconds. By the time your finger is up, yeah. it's done. Yeah, under or hundred milliseconds. Yeah, yeah. So hardly any time at all. Okay. Uh, what do we have time for? Maybe one one more. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do the one that's called day five, day eight, which is I heard you like red. <laughs> this was fun. Okay, so for this one, you're trying to emulate a program, uh, a very simple uh, computer instructions. So these letters A, B, C that are here are registers, and all the registers have have um, a string name to them. It doesn't. It can't be one letter. It can be longer things than that. But everything is a register. Um, this command, so either increment or decrement, this means increase or decrease by this amount, if this other if this other condition is true. So this is, you add 5 to B if register A is greater than 1. Otherwise, you don't do anything. Okay? Um, here you add 1 to register A if register B is less than 5. Okay? And I think it says what you can have, I think there's... E equals less than, greater than, equal to, less than, or equal to, and equals. I think are the conditions that you have. And, oh, and they they don't tell you what all of the register names are. You have to you have to infer those from from what you get. So you assume that all of them are valid. What? So the register, if the register, so here's my input just to see what it looked like, right? And it just you probably can't read it, but there's some that are like three left. So it starts with G and K and J, Q, and if you haven't seen the register before, it's initialized to zero. Okay? So, this is one of the ones that I did pretty quickly in Perl. Like Perl, it was very easy to do in Perl. And I don't even want to try to do this in C++ because it's super hard to do in C++. But it's pretty easy to do in Perl and Python. Um, so, I will show you, so you understand the problem. And I think at the end, you have to, um, you have to return what the largest value in any of the registers is at the end of the program. And I think part two is the highest value that it ever had. So it's kind of the same question. So it's not all that, all that interesting. Um, so, day eight. 
That sounds really annoying. No, but it's, it's really not very hard at all, it turns out. Um, I should say, like this is the whole, this is the whole program. So, so what I do is I split, I call split, and um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. So there's seven tokens. If you split on spaces, every line has seven tokens. There's the first register name, this anchor deck, a number, if, and then, right, so that's how many tokens there are. Um, so I know that, that this token and this token are registers, so I, so I store those registers in a hash or a dictionary. If they don't exist, then I set them to zero. And then in Perl, all I have to do is take these, make, this is formatted exactly like Perl code. So all I have to do is put the tokens together and put a couple of like register things, like make it look like a hash, and then you it, and I've done everything that I need to do. I don't know if that makes sense. Maybe it'll make more sense when I show you what the code looks like. So. All right, so. So, I split it on spaces. Um, this is the define equals um, operator in Perl that just says if it's not defined already, <laughs> set it to zero. Um, so, and I'm storing them, like, the my register is just a hash. So that's what's doing here. Now I want to make the command. So instead of it being toke, I'm going to call it dollar sign register sub. So instead of it being a, I'm going to change that to dollar sign register sub a. And I'm doing the same thing for the fourth one. I think if it was B, I'd say dollar register sub B. Um, if it was ink, I change that to plus equals. And if it was dec, I change it to minus equals. And now I can just put them all back <laughs> together. And now I've got a valid line of Perl code that I just see now. And it does what I need to do. Because you can put ifs at the end of a statement in Perl like that. And right, so I construct the command, I eval it, and then um, <coughs> I track what the high one is, and I guess I'll get the answer, but that's that's kind of less interesting. So is line twenty two an if else statement? Line No, it's a Turing statement. So well yeah, it is. No, that's a that line twenty two is a, is a the ternary operator. It's the ternary, it, yeah. It's the, the like C has that too. That means that C, C++, C Sharp, and Java have it. Right. So that Python. means that Python. means that Python. if it's a short it's a shorthand yeah. it's a shorthand expression. That means Both. that if this statement is true, then I assign this to that variable. Otherwise, I assign that to this variable. Hmm. So for people who don't know Walt, don't ever challenge him <laughs> to cram as much into one line as possible. Oh come on! I saw what I yeah, saw what Rachel did. I'm not. <laughs> 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 yeah, but she could read mine. Well, <laughs> I mean, for varying amounts of junk. I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna say that the, the ternary operator is too complicated, then I mean, I don't. I don't can't, can't that's not even a parallelism. So, I wish Python had a proper. Curl style ternary operator then instead so, of if else. So this was, so I'll show you what the Python looked like. This is like one of the only ones where it was longer in Python than it was in Perl. Um, so we'll get to the interesting parts here. Um, This is this is just making sure they get to set to zero. Um, this is, I think, a Python three way of doing string formatting. It's kind of like an sprintf, um, where I'm basically saying that I'm going to change toke three from whatever it was to register sub open quote 
that string close quote close square bracket. So you kind of see what it's doing more or less, right? So it's a bit more, it's wordier than it is in Perl, but it's probably easier to read than it is in Perl. Uh, this is Python's, uh, right, so this is doing the same thing, except for a different token, because you have to do it twice because of two registers on the line. Um, this is how Python does that colon question mark operator. Um, so that says tok one is plus equals if the first token is ink. Otherwise, it becomes minus equals. Is that, is that easier to understand? I don't know. I, I find that whatever. It's just they try to cram things all the one line. That's actually more confusing. I think it's a little more confusing, too, but whatever. That's how Python does it. Um, in Python, you can't put the if at the end of the line like you can in Perl, so you have to rearrange the statement. So I rearrange a statement to say that if, so what am I looking at? Token four. So I have to take the second part. So if that second expression is true, so this is the register, the expression, the second part of it, then, that's my colon, is the then, then I want to do the register, the plus equals, and or the minus equals, and then the value. So it kind of looks like what you're doing. You can see that I'm making an if statement here. And um, then, this is this thing thrown through me for about an hour. Because I, I, I look, I'm printing it out, it looks fine. And nothing's happening. And it turns out that Python has an eval and an exec. And Perl has an eval. You saw why? That's how I did the eval. That's how I did it in Perl. Eval doesn't do anything. I don't know what it does. I don't know what the hell eval does. But you have to do exec. If you don't do exec, then it doesn't, it doesn't actually run the command. And you know, it doesn't have the side effects that you need for it to do. Um, I was thinking that maybe this if had to be indented eight spaces <laughs> because I was already indented here and that didn't help. <coughs> uh, yeah, so. So, I don't know what the. So, this looks kind of ugly, but really all that I'm doing is trying to make a statement. I'm, I'm just doing various string processing in both of them to make it look like a statement in that language. I'm taking what was there that was kind of in pseudocode and turning it into a, language, a statement either in Perl or in Python that I can then execute. And even though it seems like a lot of work, it's, it's pretty straightforward because all the, part, all the actual running the command happens in the interpreter, in the Python or Perl interpreter. If you want to do this in C, you can't, there's, nothing, there's no exec uh, because everything's done in compile time. So you have to do all of that work with the with the adding one to it or subtracting and checking the conditions, you have to implement all of that yourself. So that seemed like more work than I wanted to do for this. Part of me wonders, uh, look, nobody posted the solution. Part of me just wonder if you can use Bison or Yak or something to basically build oh. a parser sure, that you actually. Could. Right, and you could. That's what you would have to do. But um, I mean, this looks like a lot of work, but like, what? It's, I mean, it's really four statements to do it, five statements, right? And um, yeah, all that I'm doing is taking that thing and putting, and putting, you know, a dictionary around it, a dictionary statement around it. I'm putting the dictionary here, and I'm doing it again for the two of them. And I don't know. Would it help if I printed out the before and after? Do you see what I'm doing? Yes. Yeah. Why don't I do that? No, I
that's why they like it. This is me not using them all the time. <coughs> okay. So great. So this statement becomes that statement, but we'll only put space. We'll put space for a second. So here, this B became a reg, quote, B, unquote. The ink became a plus equals. The five became a five. The if just went over here, or actually I put the if in actually that way. Um, this A became that. And this and this became, I didn't have to do anything to this. And it's the same thing for all of them. Um, yeah, it definitely helps that they're just right. the a registers, fixed number of fields in the line. Right, there's only so many, there's only the same number of fields, so all you have to do is split it and put some, yeah. and put some text around it. That's all that it's doing. Yeah, you don't even have to, like, the if you don't even have to parse, it's just, you know. Right, it's just there. So that's, that's all that I'm doing. And I'll show you, I'll show you how the Perl, I'll do the same thing for Perl, just so you can see what the Perl. So here, right, so I had to do this because I wanted it all to be on one line, so I put the colon. In there. Uh, for Perl, it's even easier, even though the code was a bit more obfuscated. Right, because everything's already in the same the right order for Perl, so I'm really doing the same thing, except I'm doing I'm putting different text around it. But I take the C becomes <coughs> reg sub C. This becomes a plus equals. The equals ten just stays the way it is. Um, the deck becomes a minus equals. Right, so it's pretty. I mean. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward, actually, though the code makes it maybe look more obfuscated than it really is. Well, like you said, that's really because you're sort of writing a parser inside of Perl. Yeah, but there's, it's a really simple parser. No, 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 I get right? it, right? And, and um, parses by definition, though, right. nasty. Right, Perl already can do some of the parsing. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm taking what they had and turning it into Perl code. Yeah. Um, and turning it into Perl code was only like three lines of code to turn it into Perl code. <coughs> So it's already like after nine, so we probably should probably should finish up. But anyone have any other questions or anyone's kind of overwhelmed? Pretty much. But it does help out a lot for us who are going to be diving into this. Because we are going to get to those problems. Right, when we get to the problems, if you remember how I did them. Maybe, or we also know the fact that it's GitHub Waltman as the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can look at my code. Uh, Honestly, that's also another fun exercise. If you want to get better at pulling interesting code snippets out of uh, out of uh, GitHub, Admin of Code is a fantastic time to really practice your hacking. Oh, GitHub yeah, for your solutions. Yeah, yeah. Then you can take it up a notch and see if you can find any interview. Oh, that's power. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll show you. 
this is today's. Today's is So, the um, is actually called I nine one five. What you have. These are supposedly programs. No, 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 these are, no, it won't, it won't each of these numbers is a program ID, the and these are it's supposedly the other programs that they're connected to over a pipe. But don't pay any attention to that. They're really graphs. It's really a graph. Yeah, um, so this means that zero is connected to two. One is just connected to itself. Two has a connection to zero, three, and four, and so on. And so. You have to load all of these in, and obviously it's going to be a big long list, like they all are. And um, you have to say how many other programs can you reach from program zero? It's like zero. Okay. And there is ways to do this. You can deal with like trying to do unions of the sets and things like that, but. It turns out if you use if you use um, a graph library, it's really easy. You build a graph of all sure. these. So you say that there's an edge between zero and two, and one and one, and two and uh, yeah, two and zero, and two and three, and two and four, all the pairs. And then you just look at the connecting components and look for the one that has zero in it, and it's done all the work for you. So I'll show you what it might look like. So I use some some module called um, Network X, which is a graph. Um, here's the whole code. It's like 20 lines of code. Oh. And I, I think I know it. I I had something very similar to this before. This is. Um, so you split. You take off the the new line. So you do a reg X where it's a number. It's actually doing all the regs. And then. This funky arrow, and then another another you know, bunch of stuff at the end. That's the from the two you split on on a comma on a comma space. Now you have an array of twos. For every one of them, you make an edge. You look at the connected components in Python. It always turns out the one with zero is the first one. It was more complicated in Perl because it came in a random order. Um, and you just look at the length of it, and that's it. Um, so. Easy to do it that way. Otherwise, you'd be you know, you're looking through you're looking through algorithms textbooks to try to figure out how to do it. There's something called a. Um, so if we go through the algorithm textbooks, are you going to help us? Yeah, you want to if you the algorithm you want to use is called the union find the union find algorithm. Oh. Did you use that last year at all? With the made, bunnies. I in what? With the bunnies. Because there's one where. The bunnies were trying to run around, and you had to find where there's an intersection where they would basically cross over their own path. And I didn't know if you would use graph theory for that, or if you just use some, something a little bit more draconian. <coughs> there were so many bunny problems last year, mm -hmm. I don't remember. It was really there. early on. It was the one where if the bunny could move uh, in a direction, but it would turn left or right, and then that number in that direction. You can also go to F of code slash 2016 and find the exact problem. <coughs> this is what happens when you've solved all of them and you get some snow or something. And you get to see a monorail. <coughs> is this it? You're going to have to tell me when, it, when it's there. It was not the bathroom code. I think it was like maybe. <coughs> no. That was it. No. It was definitely within the first six. Oh, uh, definitely not that one. That one sucked. No, I think it was probably two, and I think you skipped that one. Two? Yeah. Suppose your instructions are, then you move two up one, and then scroll down the bottom. Mm -hmm. No. Damn it. Oh, yeah. That's the whole reason why you want to go do this, is just to unlock all the colors. <laughs> is it worth it? You bet. Wait, the keypad? <laughs> this, this guy? It might have been. It was just something about bunnies and directions. Because I know it wasn't the year before because I didn't touch that one. Let's see how it is. So, anyone who wants to play along with Advent of Code and you don't know how to program, Please check Waltman's GitHub. 
<laughs> and see, and it's a good exercise as a sysadmin to figure out how to link your input to someone else's code you have no idea, and then blame the programmer. <laughs> oh, my fault. <laughs> oh, and if you are programming any of this, there's one thing I want to let everyone know. Do not worry about protecting your data, uh, uh, your data ingestion. It is one of the nice cases of all your data is pure. They don't throw any random garbage in there to handle. So if they say, hey, here's a, here's a text file to look okay. at, they're not going to be crazy. So you don't you know, normally take your web text box inputs and pipe them into eval? Well, I don't no, know. No, no. <laughs> I don't know which one you're talking about. Maybe it was the first one. <clears throat> it might have been. Oh, that was the first one. Holy crap. First one, the first one's never hard. Well, in classic fashion, I had more problems with the first one than I did the third well, one for this year. Is. I don't know. I don't know what to do. But the code's there. It doesn't look like they have commented at all. I don't remember even what the problem was. Uh, basically, it was like uh, they were trying to move where the bunny would move, but at some point, it was trying to basically find the first time the bunny would go over its own tracks. I thought that might be part two. We'll that was try. definitely part two. Oh, part two. Taxi two. Also, oh. again, you did it the long way. This is Pearl. Yeah, you did it the long, the long way. This problem could be solved in six lines <clears throat> in Python or Perl. Um, okay. What you do is you, you would map the coordinates to... Uh, I mean, telling me I can do it in six lines when I don't even remember what the problem was is probably not <laughs> super useful to me. Um, oh, what problem was? Maybe I did it last slide. I probably didn't do it last slide. But look, I was doing the width and for everything back then too because it's the only way I do that or files. Um, I think I stored them in a dictionary, right? I stored where I, I stored where it had been in a dictionary, and then I checked whether like I stored all the things there, and if it was I've already been hit, then I um, like I didn't use it anymore. That's probably what I did. Um, yeah, so anyway, so that's the advent of code. Thanks for all of your questions. Thank you.